increase, but I must decrease. This is one of the most profound revelations offered in Scripture, but it's one that we don't pay attention to very often. It is spoken by John the Baptist after his disciples report to him that Jesus is baptizing. They're indignant about this. Who does he think he is? This young upstart, this guy from Nazareth, who suddenly thinks he's the Messiah. There's a, a petulant tone in the words of John's disciples. Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, the one to whom you testified, he's here baptizing. And they're all going to him instead of you, instead of us. They're like elementary school tattletales. They think that Jesus is forming in on John's territory, stealing the limelight. So John has to remind them, okay, remember, I told you he's the one that I was speaking about. I'm just the best man. He's the groom. He's the one you should pay attention to. He must increase, but I must decrease. Ooh, that is not what we Americans like to hear. What do you mean, I must decrease? What are you saying, that, that in order for Jesus to grow, that I have to somehow become diminished? No way, not me. I work too hard for what I am and what I've done and what I own. Don't tell me that I need to decrease. No siree. That, my friends, is what we call the ego. It's that voice in our head that demands its own way, that wants to protect its own territory. It craves attention and wants to feel noticed and important. You probably know some two-year-olds like this, right? <laughs> you probably know some adults like this too, right? <laughs> well, these kinds of people have a drama going on around them all the time, right? Because they want to get what they want. And if they don't get what they want, what happens? They throw a temper tantrum, exactly. At the age of two, they're all like the seagulls in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 me, mine, mine. It's all about me, it's all about me. Now, having a sense of self-identity is important. It's a healthy thing. It's it's how we develop, it's part of growing up. It's what helps us to survive as a species, self-preservation. The problem is when that two-year-old is never taught to mature beyond the little tyrant phase. And they're not taught how to become compassionate, empathetic, generous adults. When the spoiled Veruca Salt in Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, you all have all seen that, right? When she is not disciplined, she becomes a spoiled brat, right? She becomes a monster. That attachment to ego is what leads to anger and jealousy and violence and even war when the ego overtakes entire tribes or even entire nations. And more and more, we're seeing this exaggerated ego magnified in the voices of politicians, in the rhetoric about certain forms of foreign policy, and, and in advertisements that do everything that they can to appeal to your ego. All the little egos running around trying to puff themselves up. Advertisements play to them. And if you were very honest with yourself, you could admit that sometimes that two-year-old tyrant rises up in you sometimes, in certain circumstances, right? I know it rises up in me. Just ask my husband. <laughs> but what John realized is that the I that gives us a sense of self 
is actually just an illusion. In fact, nearly every major religious teacher, from Buddha to Jesus to Guru Nanak to Muhammad to the Dalai Lama, have each reiterated this teaching in some form, that your ego is not real. It's not the real you. It's just a projection of your two-year-old mind writ large upon your inner screen. Your ego is not what's true. What's true is, well, truth with a capital T, truth. This truth is the great I am, the divine, the God in whom both Jesus and John are baptizing. This God, this truth, is trying to help you to understand that you are in fact connected to something much bigger than your own ego. So if we can learn to discipline the little tyrant, to have it decrease, then we make room for God's truth to increase in us. And that truth, with a capital T, is what leads to contentment, generosity, forgiveness, and the desire to care for God's creation. The word for increase is very much rooted in God's creation, in the natural world. The word is oxano, and it's where we get the word augment, which means to grow large, to increase in size, to flourish. It's a word that is used many times in the Old Testament to describe growth. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Oxana. The mustard seed, Oxana, grows, becomes the greatest of the trees and the bushes. And the seed that falls in good soil, Oxana, grows to a hundredfold. And the word is used to describe faith, how it can grow in a whole group of people. Like in the book of Acts, where the number of Christians exploded to 3,000 in one day, like seeds in springtime just sprouting up all over the place, like dandelions. I remember driving down across Church's Road and coming down through the valley and just seeing an entire carpet of dandelions earlier this summer, like seeds of faith just sprouting up. And in fact, Jesus is described using this word oxano when he's described as a young boy and then a young man growing ex oxano in spirit. Paul tells us that the seed is planted in water by us, but it is God who makes the seed grow. And it's a mystery how it works. When we can study science all we want. How many of you are scientists here? Or like science and biology, okay? All right, so we can study science. And that's a good thing. And we can try to replicate the biological processes by which growth happens. But the reality is that when life first arose on this planet, that moment is one that can never actually be repeated. Because it was a moment of divine truth. Anything we do now with our sophisticated technology is just child's play compared to that original genesis of life, calling life into existence. Any tricks that we pull off with bioengineering and genetic engineering are only possible because of that original moment of divine truth, that divine love that called life into existence. Today, we are celebrating another life that has been called into existence. We have another young seed in our midst. Wade Silas Cooley is being brought to the font where he will be watered with the drops of baptism and he will grow in the good soil, this garden that is 
united and correct. But it is God who will increase his faith. Only God can do that. And again, it's a mystery how it works. Just like the science of biology, the growth of faith is kind of a mystery. And we can study theology and anthropology all we want. In fact, I spend an entire semester with students studying religion. How does it come about? What are the theories as to why human beings are religious? But the reality is that when faith first appeared among human beings, that is something that is a moment of divine truth. And while seminaries can teach pastors and lay leaders about how to create the processes and the conditions to help spiritual growth happen, and I'll be looking forward to being part of that educational process, the truth is that it is God who calls faith into existence. Now that's not to say that we don't have our part in this. And this is where John's words <clears throat> become so important. God must increase, but I must decrease. He's talking about the process by which we whittle down the ego, where we pull the rocks out of the garden so that the seeds can grow. We release the clinging that we have to the selfish and self-serving thoughts, words, and deeds that get in the way of Christ growing in us. But when Paul talks about being crucified in Christ, it's about that diminishing of the ego so that Christ can grow in us. And this has different names in different religions. Buddhists call it Buddha nature. Hindus call it Atman, the indwelling of God. Muslims call it submission. That's where Islam comes from. It means to submit, to submit one's will to God. I must decrease so that God can increase in me. And that's one of the reasons why being involved in a faith community is so important. I know, I know, you can, you can connect with God on the golf course or in your hunting blind or out in the woods. I do that too. Well, not golf. I'll leave that to Mike. I can go out in nature and connect with God in lots of different ways. But there are some key things that the community of Christ does that you can't get out there on your own. And one of them is the confrontation with this truth that can help to bring your ego into check. And this is where the church is so important because it's a place where you can discipline your little tyrant, your little two-year-old inside of you, in order to get him to relax and trust that things are gonna be taken care of. And you can let go of your selfishness, your pettiness, your desire to increase yourself. Prayer is one of those practices. Last week, one of our young people said that prayer is like talking to Santa Claus, and we're going to get all of those good things from the big Santa Claus in the sky. Well, that's not really how God works. Prayer is a way to decrease your ego so that the divine truth of Christ can increase in you. For example, the Living Lutheran this month we've got some copies downstairs, has an article called Religion, Good for Our Health and Well-Being. And it tells of a couple who tried for seven years to get pregnant. Through prayer and regular worship and Christian counseling, they realized that something was not right in their marriage. Their own egos. Their egos were getting in the way of their growth as a couple. And it took many years of work to decrease their own egos so that there could be room for their spiritual selves to welcome a child. She said, the wife said, it surprised both of us that by asking God to take the lead in healing our marriage and rebuilding trust, how quickly strides were made in both areas. 
without prayer and faith in God being there and directing our steps, we would be a long way from where we are now. And where they are now is, fittingly, with a two-year-old boy who they are now raising in the faith. And they are going to help him to learn how to decrease so that God can increase. Just like Justin and Nicole will help Wade, even as he is growing, to help to learn his, to teach his ego to decrease so that Christ can increase in him. As I am nearing the end of my time as your pastor with you, there are some things that I want you to remember during the transition to calling your new pastor. And one of the things is this. No matter who is standing in this pulpit, don't stay away from your pew. And I say that again. No matter who is standing in this pulpit, don't stay away from your pew. Because it's going to be very tempting to say to yourself, well, I'm not going to go to church until the new pastor is there. Or I don't feel like going to church until the new pastor comes. When you hear that voice, that's your ego talking. Because it's all about you and what you want. The church is not just about you. It's about us. It's about the we not just the me. And when we take the time to recognize our ego for what it is and discipline it and say, now, now, you're coming to church, just like you would with a two-year-old who's going to fight and scream and doesn't want to get in the car, but then once they're here, they actually have a pretty good time. You have to do that with your own little inner two-year-old. Because while the pastor is important, even that is not what church is about. If it was, that means the pastor's ego is a problem. The church is always supposed to be about Christ. Even the pastor must decrease so that Christ can increase. And that's why we have the sacraments of baptism and communion and reading the Bible and praying and learning and coming to Sunday school. All of these are the practices of faith, that divine truth that does not change no matter who stands here. And your ego needs to be submitted to those practices so that God can increase in you. Now is not the time to stay away from church. In fact, this is exactly the time when you need to be in church doing the work of the body of Christ to prepare yourself for your next pastor. Just like that couple who did not yet have a child, went to church, prayed, did some serious discerning. They were intentional about it. This is the time for you to be preparing, coming to worship, praying, talking with each other, making sure that God is directing your steps individually and as a congregation. Besides, Wade is counting on you. You're making a commitment to him today, just like his parents, Nicole and Justin, are making that commitment to be here for him, to make sure he has a church to go to, and a Bible to read, and a Sunday school class to learn about Jesus. Our youth are counting on you to make sure that their little egos are decreasing and God's truth can increase. Your spouse is counting on you. Your coworker is counting on you. Your enemy is counting on you. This community is counting on you. The world is counting on you to decrease so that Christ may increase. Amen.